Hey everybody, I'm Tom from AWS, and I'm joined today by Tolga from Anika. Hi there. Hi, welcome. Thank you. And so Tolga, what does Anika do? Anika is an AWS premier consulting partner. Awesome, and we're going to talk about one of your projects today. That's, that's right. This is, a, this is a project for a company that has uh, tanks, and we need to monitor the fill level of these tanks. Awesome. So it looks like we've got a tank here, um, and then you you're, uh, have some type of sensor on that that's going to communicate, in this case, it looks like to AWS IoT. Correct. So we have instrumented this tank with uh, fill level sensors, and we know how full it is. We connect over TLS to and via MQTT mm -hmm. to the IoT service. And then in the IoT service, we route to kind of two different uh, rules, one up to Firehose and, and one over to uh, a Kinesis stream. Okay, so let's talk about the upper one first. So um, what are you routing into Firehose? So the raw sensor data about how full we are and at what time goes into Firehose, which ultimately stores that data in S3. Okay. And this allows our human analysts to do uh, kind of analysis after the fact on the time series data. So how fast do these fill up? Um, how can we predict when they're going to fill up? Can we build an ML model around when they might fill up under certain circumstances? And awesome. so that's, uh, that's our human here. And you're using S3, uh, obviously, uh, for uh, cost and durability reasons. Exactly. So, so very inexpensive storage. Um, the raw data just sits there, and we can apply different analytic techniques to it, depending on what we want to do with the data. Awesome. And then how long do you keep your data in S3? So we keep it in S3 for about a year, and then we life cycle it out, to actually, to, uh, to Glacier. And so we can grab it from Glacier if we have a project that requires us to go look further back. Okay. Uh, than the one year we've got in S3. And you're using uh, S3 lifecycle policies to do that automatically? Correctly, yeah, they just move automatically. Fantastic, all right. So here we're using Firehose. Why did you choose to use Firehose uh, as opposed to just using Kinesis like we have down here? Yeah, so up here, Firehose lets us get data into S3 with no compute uh, utilization on our part. So messages flow all the way from the tank through the system into S3. We never spent a single cent on compute. Down here on the Kinesis stream, we're actually using that as a buffer in front of Lambda and delivering those messages to Lambda. The benefit of having Kinesis in between IoT and Lambda is that Kinesis serves as a buffer for us. So if our Lambda fails, let's say we have a deployment and there was a, a, a coding error, and now Lambda is failing at execution time, normally those messages would actually be lost. But with the Kinesis buffer in the middle, we're able to reprocess those messages when we repair whatever happened downstream. That's a great use case for Kinesis. Kinesis will store those messages for up to seven days. That's right, that's right. We have one more really interesting Kinesis use case, which is on the other side of Lambda. And so here, we actually queue messages up to Kinesis and come right back into a different Lambda. The, uh, the purpose of this one is actually to serialize uh, certain operations. So imagine a dozen tanks all in the same area. We don't want to assign the same technician to go service all those tanks. But they could fill up at the exact same time, and that could result in us concurrently kind of assigning the same human to, the sa to multiple tasks. By uh, putting those back in Kinesis and keying them off of the geographic area, we're able to have only one assignment taking place at a time inside of the, our Lambda here. But since it's, not, uh, since it's keyed off of area, it's not a scaling problem, because if there are different areas, then we have concurrent assignments happening in different areas. Got it. So you're really using Kinesis in that case as a way to do queuing or, or, or like a FIFO. That's correct, yeah. yeah. It's actually like a little cloud-based locking system uh, ensuring that we're only doing one thing at a time for this really important part of our workload. Awesome. And then how do you actually do the assignments? How does, how does the technician know which tank to go service? Yeah, so Lambda actually sends notifications via push notifications out to the uh, mobile apps. Mm -hmm. Uh, but before we do that, we actually store some real-time data in DynamoDB. So in DynamoDB, we're storing kind of an active working data set. So this is the real-time information about which tanks are full or filling and kind of what's going on in the real world. Again, remember up here we had sort of the historical time series data, whereas here we kind of have the real-time here and now uh, Got it. data. Got it. Cool. So that mobile app that got notified then is able to access uh, the data that's in DynamoDB through API Gateway and additional lambdas that present kind of a, a RESTful API. Got it. So mobile developers are able to build this mobile application and just kind of be unaware of all this and, and consume an easy, simple RESTful API. Cool. So one of the things that's really apparent to me is that you're, you have a completely serverless architecture. Was that intentional? It was, yeah. We actually, yeah. We actually wanted to deploy uh, completely serverlessly for cost purposes and also okay. for 
high availability purposes. So all of these services are regional. Uh, none of them will fail if a single AZ fails. Awesome. And what, what, how long does it take for a message, so from the time that a sensor triggers in the tank, to a uh, technician getting a notification? About one second to, to go through all these different components. Um, and, uh, and so it's essentially real time. Amazing. And how much does this cost? So that's the really neat thing about this architecture is that when idle, uh, it costs just pennies because most of these services are consumption based. We do have some provisioned capacity in Dynamo and Kinesis that we pay for at the idle state, but it really just becomes kind of pennies at that point. At full production capacity with thousands of tanks, we do this for about $1,000 a month. Awesome. This is a really cool architecture and some really unique uh, ways to use AWS services. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Tolga. Thank you. And thank you for watching. This is my architecture. <laughs>